Bicondylar type C fractures of the tibia plateau show as a rule on the lateral side an area of considerable impaction of the articular surface, while on the medial side we usually observe a large bone block that has been avulsed or sheared off in one piece. An example is this type C3 fracture with considerable comminution laterally, but with an intact intercondylar eminence. To fix such complex fractures, we now prefer to use two separate incisions, one posteomedially and one laterally, in order not to interfere with the most delicate soft tissue cover over the tibial tuberosity. As landmarks, we have the patella and the two joint lines. We start on the posteromedial side to reduce the simpler fracture first, followed by the straight lateral approach. The reconstruction of the medial plateau occurs in three steps. Exposure via a straight postural medial incision, placement of a one-third tubular or 3.5 LCDC plate on the medial tibial crest in an anti-glide function, and preliminary fixation with two screws. The medial incision is directed dorsally to the pes anserinus, which is elevated or partially incised, depending on the fracture configuration. After clearing the fracture gap, the reduction is achieved by pushing the medial bone block upwards. A five-hole, one-third tubular plate is now positioned onto the posteromedial crest of the tibia. Only minimal plate contouring is required, if at all. Next, a 2.5 millimeter hole is drilled just distal to the apex of the fracture. Measuring with the depth gauge. Tapping with the 3.5 millimeter tap. Insertion of a cortical screw through the middle hole of the plate. This maneuver pushes the plate to its anti glide or buttress position, thus reducing the fracture indirectly. After placing the most proximal screw, the middle screw has to be retightened. By adding the most distal screw, the medial fixation can be concluded. In most cases, it is far simpler and less traumatizing to reduce the medial plateau fracture via this separate approach rather than through the traditional anterolateral incision. At this point, an intraoperative X-ray control is advisable, as demonstrated in our clinical example with a preliminary fixation medially. The lateral impacted plateau fracture is reconstructed with the following steps. Exposure of the tibial articular surface through a straight lateral approach. Repair of the meniscal tear. Reduction of the impacted joint fragment. Filling of the metaphysial bone defect with an autograft. Lateral buttressing with plate and or screws. 
For the approach, we chose a straight incision running laterally to the patella and tibial tuberosity. We proceed rather directly down to the bone without separating the different layers too much. The knee joint is opened via a horizontal arthrotomy distally to the meniscus. If the meniscus is avulsed, it is now advisable to place two to three resorbable sutures into the rim of the tear for later reattachment. To fully appreciate the extent of the damage to the lateral plateau, the condyle is now gently opened through the anterior fracture line. Next, the most central impaction is elevated with a pusher. The metaphyseal bone defect is filled with cancellous bone, or preferably a bicortico cancellous autograft from the iliac crest, which can be shaped to give a tight fit, providing good mechanical support. After reducing the lateral construct, it's best held in place by a pointed reduction forceps. One or two Kirschner wires placed parallel to the joint line further secure the reconstructed articular surface. After removing the reduction forceps, an L buttress plate is placed to support the lateral condyle by buttressing it. Alternatively, and depending on the fracture configuration, a T buttress or a tibia head buttress plate can be used. Before placing any screws, it's advisable to check the quality of the reduction by x-rays in two planes. The articular surface can also be visualized. The correct position of the K-wire allows the plate to be slid over. The first hole should be drilled through the slotted hole, thus permitting some secondary correction of the plate position. In our model, this will be an interfragmentary lag screw. We therefore start with the 3.2 mm drill bit. We measure the screw length with the depth gauge. We use the 4.5 mm drill bit for the gliding hole. Four point five mm tapping. The placement of a 4.5 mm cortical screw without tightening it completely. After possible correction of the plate alignment, the 6.5 mm cancellous bone screws are now placed parallel to the joint line. Drilling with the 3.2 mm drill bit. Depth measurement. Tapping with the 6.5 mm cancellous tap. And finally, application of the 6.5 mm screw with a long 32 mm thread. The more dorsal hole in the L-plate is usually hard to reach from the front, so we suggest that a stab incision be added over the hole as shown here.
Although not available for this exercise, the oscillating drill attachment can be of great help and increase safety in such situations. Care must be taken not to penetrate the medial cortex by screws that are too long, since this could easily irritate the medial ligaments and pes anserinus. Once the distal cortical screws have been placed, the reconstruction of the lateral side is concluded, while medially more screws could be added. The quality of the reconstruction of the articular surface may now be judged by inspecting the joint surface, while x-rays allow the correct axial alignment to be confirmed. In our clinical example, the x-rays show a rather nice alignment and reconstruction of the bicondylar fracture. The cortical cancellous autograft, placed vertically, can clearly be identified as it supports the elevated articular fragment. Finally, the three-year follow-up of the patient after partial implant removal. The 35-year-old female has minimal discomfort and almost symmetrical knee function and is active again in sports such as hiking, skiing, and tennis.